who will give you the highlights and lessons learned from the FCHAU funded uh, Certify initiative. We will then move on to an intense panel discussion that will be moderated by Yorgos Shachimarkakis. He is the Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe and a well known person in the hydrogen field. And he will also be able to give us more insights in the industry perspective and demands on this, I would say, very, very important topic. After that, we will also be joined by Andreas Kulma, and he is actually the CEO of uh, DENA. And for those who do not know uh, DENA yet, DENA is the German Energy Agency. And he will be able to, uh, to shed some light on the hydrogen certification activities that are envisioned by DENA uh, as well, their activities internationally on this topic, because you know very well that Germany is very, very active internationally and uh, making a lot of MOUs. So I'm looking forward to, to hear uh, his views. And of course, in the next um, slide, please, uh, we welcome, of course, the uh, questions from, uh, from the audience, which you can put in the chat and look also forward to an interactive uh, discussion. So I would say don't be shy. Uh, the event will be recorded, as you know, and also um, you have there, you can see here on this slide, very nice, the Q&A box. Uh, so if you want to write a, a question to the panel, please write it there in this Q&A box and, and not in the chat, as I mentioned before, but really in the Q&A box. Um, if you have any technical issues, well, that's the uh, email address where you can uh, send an email. So. Before I hand over uh, to Galen and Wouter, uh, let me give you a brief overview of our activities in this really important uh, field. At the FCHJU, we started really to work on, on, issue, on the issue of hydrogen certification already back in 2014, so that's more than seven years ago, through the funding at that time of a very dedicated grant to, to develop a definition, so really the definition for green and for low carbon hydrogen as well as to make a roadmap for the implementation of a guarantees of origin scheme. At that time, it was based on this roadmap that we decided uh, to proceed to the second phase of uh, support to this initiative, which is then now known as Certify 2, uh, where we really designed and implement a pilot uh, guarantees of origin scheme consisting of four different hydrogen uh, produ uh, producing plants. It was one in Germany, one in France, one in the Netherlands, and one in Belgium. In this pilot operation, we actually managed to issue more than 70,000 geos, and it was really encouraging to see that already at this early stage that we are now, to see already some of these geos were purchased and used by, for example, the Transport for London Authority, but also by Hydrogen Mobility uh, Deutschland or Germany to prove really the origin of the hydrogen that was dispensed at their hydrogen refueling stations. We believe that ensuring transparency and empowering the consumer choice as an essential, an essential element for the successful rollout of the clean hydrogen economy. Nevertheless, it is equally important that we develop a system that not only can support the consumer disclosure, but can also support clean hydrogen producers and consumers to demonstrate their compliance with targets set in the regulation, such as, for example, here in Europe, the Red 2. In September 2020, we therefore launched the third phase uh, of support, known as Certify 3, which will work on both of these aspects. First, by supporting our member states to establish their hydrogen geo scheme, which they should do by the end of this year. And secondly, by designing a system for the issuance of certificates for target uh, compliance. So now I would like to hand over the word uh, to uh, Galen uh, Gentjev. Uh, he will explain the views from DGNR. Very well, welcome, uh, welcome Galen, to this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and please share with us the views of DGNR in our the commission in this respect. 
thank you very much for the floor and for this opportunity to take part of that uh, of this very interesting debate. I think uh, it's just uh, one step in in this longer reflection and building up a certification system. I'll ju just go directly since we have we're short of time. I'll go directly to the to the point and trying to to uh, reflect on the policy um, perspective of a of a, of a, full, of a you know, fully fledged and EU wide certification uh, system uh, in the context also of the revision of Red Two. Um, as you as you know, um, the, the the current reflection uh, around the revision of the of the Red Two uh, was the result of, of the ambitious targets um, and um, um, and the commitments taken under the European Green Deal. Um, since the 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 the, the real re, um, total uh, revision of Red Two was done was done. Um, um, at, at the at, uh, at at the moment of the of the recast, so the the current revision the current revision is just um, um, the the result of the need um, to adjust uh, red two in order to enable the the achievement of the most ambitious targets. And from that point of view, uh, as part of that reflection is also the reflection of, of the role of the certification system. And uh, as mentioned in the in the energy system integration strategies and hydrogen strategy. Um, such such uh, full decarbonization and such an ambitious uh, objective could be achieved by uh, a meaningful portfolio of energy decarbon uh, um, energy decarbonizing um, uh, so solutions and uh, uh, taking also uh, from the point and, and the assumption that full elect electrification would be difficult to achieve then uh, uh, the certification system is there in order to uh, support uh, the certification of um, of a portfolio of decarbonizing solutions, uh, and this way giving the opportunity of member states through their national uh, energy climate plans to use that 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 um, uh, energy solutions uh, specifically for how to de decarbonize sectors uh, in order to um, to have more flexibility uh, in in the in the allocation of of of, uh, of, of resources and supporting different energy energy uh, solutions from that point of view from that point of view um, um, it's it's um it's it's important to um, to see what is the the role of the certification system specifically for for, for hydrogen and how in this reflection um, the, the the certification system would evolve. First reflection, obviously, what should be covered. So the first reflection covered the, the terminology, um, reflecting on definitions of of uh, renewable on the renewable side, but also on the definitions on the low carbon the so called low carbon fuels. Um, um and the point the point uh, on the low carbon side obviously is what is also the place where where actually to um, to um, uh, define and respectively uh, certify the second aspect uh, aspect obviously is how the certification the existing certification system should evolve in order to tackle the the, the challenge of being a uh, EU wide certification system, and uh, from from um, from that um, um, perspective, uh, the point is basically um, to how to uh, in a, in, a, in a system integration spirit uh, um, to use the existing infrastructure, which means um, using the existing system of voluntary schemes and what uh, and what uh, the certification has already achieved um and f f uh, basing it also of course on the on the methodologies for uh for um for for, uh, for rfnbos recycled carbon fuels what um basically the infrastructure um is under under the implementation of red 2 which is part uh, part of, of, of that um, future certification system and the point is um, how this all this will be um let's say um enshrined in the in the future uh, certification system in such a way as to achieve the objectives uh and um, here there are, there, are, there are several several aspects um basically one aspect is how to integrate the the, the geo system uh in a in a in a u wide and is it possible to, to do that and um the, the other the other alternative is um if we'll be basing the the certification system on voluntary schemes all, all on a, on a, on a something else then how how all this information uh should fit, fit the, the 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 certification results and um 
uh, a very important point, at least for me as well, not to to avoid having different different layers of of of, of uh, uh, certification with uh, basically avoiding avoiding the uh, of having different um, different um, uh, let's say um, green or or or, or uh, uh, low carbon solutions for for um, uh, consumer information or for the purposes of the value chain so so to say to combine this in a in a one uh, single certificate uh, which uh, would serve the purposes of consumer information and and um, value chain value chain needs in in order to be able to uh, to calculate the footprint of the final products in a life cycle uh, uh, approach. So from from that point of view, I would say this is the the difficulty also in the in the hydrogen certification. Um, how to to achieve this this um, basically two needs in 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 one to avoid that we have um, let's say potentially a, a low level of certification only for consumer purposes or, or light certification but um, let's say a more a more um, thorough approach for the uh, certification for, for for the value chain and um, yeah this this basically um, is the the, the, the the challenge we're trying to, to tackle in the in the um, in setting up uh, uh, your white certification system um, Covering the, the all the energy carriers and achieving the the the, the needed results for cost, for consumer information and uh, from the point of view of the value chain in in in, in one. So with this, I, I will I will stop here and uh, I'm looking forward for the for, for the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Galen, uh, for your explanation and and to I'd say explain carefully uh, what are the challenges still ahead for this certification and perhaps we can come back on that on a few of them uh, during the panel discussion later on now it's, it's a big honor also for me to introduce uh, Wouter van Hout uh, from Hinicio and uh, of course he has been uh, leading the projects already since 2014 from certify one two and three so Wouter uh, the word is you Thank you very much, uh, Bart. So um, I'm going to try to uh, to complement already what uh, what you've been mentioning because I think you already gave a great introduction into the certify. Uh, what we've been doing since uh, since 2014, and I will also try to uh, to add on some of the, of the uh, things that uh, Galin has been uh, been mentioning. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we're gonna. This is my uh, brief agenda. Uh, first of all, re re reminding us why why we are doing this. Then uh, pointing maybe very uh, briefly on uh, again what is a geo system and uh, and what is it not. What was the status towards the end of the certified two program? Um, and I think uh, and and then we'll uh, continue also uh, giving a heads up on uh, on what certified three uh, uh, is doing. So can if we can go to slide number four so the, the next one and uh, it's apparently with animation so um, again so uh, what has already been mentioned by uh, by Bart please go ahead with the animation still we'll get a full picture in view of uh, of time um, the the energy union really below believes in consumer empowerment in consumer empowerment that's what these geos are all about and therefore i like to compare it against the data sheet of a car where it's very important that we find in a, a uniform way uh, on to agree what is on that data sheet and there are a number of items first of all what are the criteria what are the units because for a customer it's difficult to compare liters per kilometer against miles to the gallon so we need to try to harmonize on that but especially after diesel gate consumers are getting more and more smart and they're also asking with regards to consumption what is the drive cycle who is measuring that who is validating the laboratories who are sure checking that and i think we need to come up with something consistent for the hydrogen uh, industry um and then thereafter it can be a consumer when he has that data sheet that can sometimes judge for their own on what is the most eco-friendly car and when we look at uh, this particular data sheet some people might say it's car x some people might say it's car y 
And so uh, a four against a five seater and so forth and so on. So this is really enabling con consumer choice. But we need to get that data sheet correctly. If we can go to the next slide. So especially uh, one of the most uh, important elements that we have to take into account when we look at uh, the, the production of hydrogen is that it's, um, it's never a primary energy source. It has to be produced from something into a great variety of, uh, of pathways. And here I've been taking the example of a chloralkali electrolyzer. And there we can see that the carbon intensity is coming from the electricity that's being used on the input. And that carbon intensity needs to be spread out uh, over the three outputs being chlorine, caustic and hydrogen. I can already mention that chlorine ain't, um, uh, ain't an energy product. So the, the, the whatever that the red two prescribes on energy based allocation, it doesn't really work here. And so I think it's important that we are taking, I would say, management decisions or that we get uh, to uniform uh, decisions to avoid that a similar data sheet for such a production plant in country X against country Y would yield different data because that would be very confusing to, uh, to a user. If we can go to the, the next uh, two slides, seven already, so move two slides onwards. So what is a geo system? This is the, this is the, the legal basis of a uh, geo system. I won't be going into, uh, into details, but it's about consumer disclosure. Maybe people can review it afterwards uh, when we give the slide deck out, so we can go to the next slide. And there I would like to say that today a geo is really about explaining to a customer uh, what are the attributes at the point of production? If you can make one click, an animation will appear. So today, uh, under the current GEO system, no information is provided about the distribution or the delivery. Uh, today, no physical link is being made between the production facility and the delivered product. So that also means that for GEOs nowadays, we don't take into account the carbon intensity, uh, carbon intensity from the point of production until the point of, uh, of consumption. For hydrogen, it usually means uh, um, pipeline transport or uh, delivery by tube trailers up to a hydrogen refueling station. As Galin already mentioned, thoughts are being uh, made whether the geo system needs to be uh, expanded to also be able to go into certification, but currently, that's not the case. Um, and that so um, so that, that, that puts a, a, a big actually um, a big pressure on electrolyzer manufacturers. If we can go to the next slide, uh, electrolyzer manufacturer might want to produce renewable hydrogen that will be Article 19 compliant. And Article 19 compliant it means it's eligible to receive guarantees of origin. But the same electrolyzer could be at different periods, for instance, uh, they could be interested in producing RFNBOs. And these RFNBOs are Article 25 and 30 uh, compliant. This would mean that there are also extra uh, burden being put on the certification needs. So for the first time, we would have to check actually the, I, I call it the sustainability of the, uh, of the electricity being used by the, uh, by the electrolyzer because the red two is mentioning it should be in sync. They call it geographical and temporal correlation. And on top of that, the renewable electricity needs to demonstrate additionality. How that's being measured is still being defined under de the delegated act, but also how to certify that it's still, an, uh, it's, it's still um, unknown yet. On top of that, for this RFNBO certification, we need to take into account the emissions of the supply chain after the point of, um, of, of production, and we need to ensure a, a mass balance uh, system. So this is putting quite a lot of pressure on the certification system, especially through the uh, sectoral integration, where for the first time, renewable electricity will become hydrogen, so we have to deal with those uh, conversions. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, or even yeah, so where were we at the end of Certify 2? As Bart already mentioned, uh, we set up a huge stakeholder platform, and this, this is this stakeholder platform which is uh, actually determining all of the scheme rules. So we work closely together with industry, with policymakers, with NGOs to determine what the scheme should be uh, should be looking like. 
it is not the consultants which are determining this. We are merely using the budget of the FCGU to run the secretariat. Okay, and then when we go to the next uh, slide, so you can see that our stakeholder platform has been uh, been pretty wide. And you see here a snapshot of the amount of uh, people who uh, were present in that. It, it expanded in the meantime. To the next slide, Pat already explained that. Pat already explained that we did uh, four pilots in total. You can see our three. Uh, because I've been hiding one water electrolyzer and doing really investigating those plants to see what would be the, the carbon intensity uh, calculation, uh, how to do, uh, how to assess the renewability of the hydrogen being produced, which is far from obvious if you go into integrated uh, chemical uh, chemical uh, complex uh, processes. Next slide, please. Next to that, uh, we've been setting up a full uh, ICT system. You can here see a snapshot of the demo uh, site, but uh, you can also find a link over where you can still find um, this system to be uh, up and running. So we have accounts. We see that more and more companies, traders, uh, potential users are creating accounts into this system. You can see that new plants are already being registered, for instance, for water electrolysis or chloralkali electrolysis. People are willing to start to use the system, and we also make it available for member states. And then to the next slide, as Bart already mentioned, um, we saw that the, the first uh, the first uh, e uh, issuance of guarantees of origin, and we saw the first uh, declarations that uh, um, of people that have been using it. Now I must admit that this uh, market is at its infancy, and we are still at the point of price discovery and business model definition. So it's actually an exciting time uh, coming up, and part of it will be supported by uh, by certified tree. So if you go to the next slide, uh, so what do we have uh, coming up? Uh, basically, we're going to work in uh, on two main topics. Topic one is geos, and topic two is moving from geos up to RF and BOS. So let me start by giving a heads up on the geo part. Next slide, please. Uh, so. Um, what we see is that uh, to have a fully functioning geo system, you have an uh, order of, uh, of of laws and standards. Uh, so you have uh, you have the Red 2 Article 19. This is of course the, the basics. We have an uh, ascent standard that's being reshaped from renewable electricity geos towards geos of any kind of energy uh, vector. On top of that, you have the IEB, it's the Association of Issuing Bodies uh, (ECS) uh, system. Which is also uh, existing, and then you would have a, a national implementation. And typically, what Certify would like to achieve is to work on all of those uh, aspects and, and make something that's completely uh, completely integrated. And I think one of the great things that we are doing is that we are investigating this uh, renewability of batches again complex into the, in, into a chemical uh, processes as well as determining allocation methods of uh, of co2 uh, footprints which nobody has been really uh, been doing and uh, and been investigating uh, like that so all of the infor all of the information that we uh, got uh, since we started to work on the project in 2014 we're now putting it available towards um, the ie base uh, gas scheme group so that's a group that I'm uh, I'm, I'm chairing, um, and uh, we're making great progress in that, and, and we're trying to elaborate a new gas scheme within the IEB system. That afterwards, their members, which are quite a lot of the European member states, will uh, will implement. So it's a great way of uh, of harmonization. On top of that, we are internationally in contact with uh, the International Partnership of Hydrogen and Fuel Cells into the Economy which is a government to government organization, DG Energy, uh, France, uh, Netherlands uh, are all part of it, as well as the Australians, uh, USA, uh, the Japanese and so forth and so onwards. And they are also making kind of a, a best recommendations on how to do greenhouse gas allocation methodologies. We are providing feedback based on all the lessons learned that we have since we've been doing this, uh, this pilot. Once we have uh, within the IEB, we uh, established uh, the gas scheme. Uh, so this is uh, this is like the establishment of a, of a more detailed standard than than SEN. Then of course it still have to be implemented at, into member state uh, legislation, and there we will hit certain barriers on 
local uh, legislation, national legislation that we didn't think of, and we, we need to see how we can deal with that. So um, the certified project is providing budgets to the uh, to the four issuing bodies that you can see on the picture: Austria, Wallonia, Flanders, and in uh, and, and the Netherlands. And on top, we uh, already uh, promised to do a first level of capacity building to establish a geo system in Morocco. And we had there already quite a lot of contacts together with Chile, as, as together with uh, with Australia, which are very interested to also see how this could uh, could work. And then to the next slide, as already mentioned uh, by Kalin. So we would have to uh, to think also of uh, if we can expand the geo to, to go towards certification. Uh, as certify, we, we definitely think it it can be. Uh, so uh, we can uh, combine a geo system together with uh, a certification uh, system that would also allow uh, to do mass balancing. And I think this is very important that currently for biofuels. We have quite a lot of problems uh, to, to make in a complete well to wheel overview on how the consignments are being tracked through the chain of custody. Well, a GO has a certain megawatt hour, so it is a consignment, and we definitely feel that, um, that there is a great way to expand the GO to make it a full-fledged RFNB or certification system. We already provided the initial thinking on how this would all uh, work together, also including uh, the union uh, the union database, and this would have as a great uh, advantage for industry that they would have only one system and one audit in which they can both issue GOs as well as obtain RFNBO uh, certificates. Voila. And maybe to end with my recommendations, uh, going two slides uh, further. Um, but I, I think uh, for renewable and low carbon hydrogen to take off, we need to have an harmonized scheme within Europe, but potentially also at, at the world level. Uh, let's not forget that the European Clean Hydrogen Strategy mentioned that we want to have a Euro denominated uh, hydrogen market worldwide. So also the certification system needs to be harmonized uh, outside of uh, Europe because we will have to deal with imports and exports. Otherwise this new energy vector will not be euro nominated. Uh, so there's a real role for policymakers to uh, to build a harmonized uh, scheme. And that's what I mentioned up front. Think of a data sheet of a car. Eh? Um, afterwards, there might be local appetites of what we call good or bad. Again, think of the car. Some people might say a car X is better, car Y is better. That depends on, uh, on local appetites. That being said, we also think that it's good that uh, there's a common label or definition internationally of what deemed good by various uh, governments, because you, you can be uh, rather sure that uh, those labels will be linked to local subsidy schemes, uh, and, and you would like to uh, harmonize those subsidy schemes uh, across the globe to the extent possible to avoid uh, market distortion. And that's basically what I would like to say in a nutshell. We're going through exciting times. Uh, and uh, we were definitely having fun. Thank you, Wouter. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you will have fun. Anyway, um, thanks for the recommendation and your uh, explanation. And uh, yeah, so we heard the, uh, the policymaker. We heard the expert who is implementing. But now let's listen to the industry. They, they are extremely important and let's hear their views. And for that, I'm very happy to introduce you, uh, Jorgo Shatsumekakis, the Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe. Jorgo, what is the answer of the industry on the certification? What do you need? Many thanks, uh, Bart. <clears throat> also many thanks for uh, um, hosting this event here and making, uh, uh, well, clarifying how important the issue is. And you can see already, uh, if you have a look at the questions um, that there's a big interest, not only how many participants are in this uh, meeting, but also the questions as such. Uh, and I have the honor to um, guide you through uh, the next uh, questions, so to say, to moderate a little bit our panel. But first of all, I would like to answer uh, your question. It is, what is the industry uh, expecting? Uh, I think we have seen the last year was uh, quite unprecedented. It was um, also a historical year where hydrogen out of a, I would say, uh, rather science fiction oriented small corner 
has become yeah, basically the other leg of the energy transition uh, next to renewable electricity. And this, of course, needs, if we want to go for scale, uh, needs also the support of a geo system, of a certification um, that helps to create a liquid market. Uh, if we go, go for the next slide, um, I would like to, uh, first of all, <clears throat> tell you that um, Hydrogen Europe has uh, proposed a paper that we um, have um, presented at the high-level conference of the European presidency, the Portuguese EU presidency, beginning of April. It's called the Hydrogen Act. Uh, and basically, an act uh, can be two things. One is uh, a legal piece uh, of many, many, uh, a big legal umbrella existing or consisting of many pieces. On the other hand, it wants to suggest we need to act because now, as of uh, 8th of July last year, the EU has a strategy, a hydrogen strategy, but uh, something written on paper is not enough. We have to act. And we believe that um, a C a certification system, a GOO system, um, must have five T's as headlines. Um, and as you can see here, the five T's are it needs to be trackable, it needs to be traceable, and these two. Uh, issues were already mentioned also by Bauter. It needs to be transparent. Um, and uh, this is very important because um, there are other geo system, systems that are not transparent enough and where, yeah, I have to say fraud has been an issue. We don't want that fraud possibility. They need to be tradable. And all these four T's together would then create a trustworthy system. Um, GEOs are, for us, essential uh, for a hydrogen system to be ramped up. Um, and we believe, and that's possibly new, uh, and here I also would like to challenge uh, Galin a little bit, um, we need a separate system uh, because hydrogen is a separate energy carrier. It's, uh, uh, it can be renewable other than gas, but it can be dispatchable other than electricity. And here, that makes hydrogen a quite specific case. So um, there are different also physical properties compared to methane. And uh, separation from the hydrocarbon gas uh, geo system is critical. We know that there are discussions going on uh, to put it under um, gas uh, certification systems. We believe it should be distinct. There is an ex uh, exemption when it comes to blending. Now, what do GOs need to include? Uh, we think, of course, the primary energy sources and the GHG footprint. Uh, and the GOs need to capture the attributes resulting from different production pathways. Uh, and that answers already one of the questions. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Bauter, uh, but also Galin later on to um, also answer this question that has al already been raised. Is it only for renewably produced hydrogen or are other pathways also encompassed? Um, and then, of course, a question that has already uh, been quite uh, frequently uh, put in the Q&A. Um, is it just European or should it be more than European? Should countries that are not part of the EU uh, be uh, included into that system? and what would be the global role. We had an excellent discussion, Bart and myself, together with Commissioner Kadri Simpson and uh, Director General uh, Ditte Jürgen Jorgensen uh, quite recently with the American counterpart, Mr. Andrew Light. And the question of an international global geo system was raised in that meeting as well. Next slide, please. Well, the industry needs to act today. And uh, that's why we are hoping that the Commission will come up with a clear proposal, possibly based on the taxonomy threshold, um, for a liquid hydrogen market of tomorrow. Uh, we are grateful for um, the certified project. It is the starting point for a European or Europe-wide system of GOs with a distinct scheme for hydrogen. Um, we believe that uh, uh, certified green hydrogen, but also certified low carbon hydrogen should be 
fit for purpose based on the threshold that uh, has been <clears throat> published by the European Commission in uh, the taxonomy regulation. We also are clear uh, if we take the discussion serious, then carbon content is the main currency of all energy carriers and vectors based on a life cycle assessment. And uh, we know that um, the GRC, Joint Research Center, is working on elements that could constitute a coherent approach. Also, the international governance for imports and exports is crucial. Um, we need a globally functional system of assessing the carbon content of the molecules and um, encompassing also other sustainability criteria. With that, I would like to pass on to um, the discussion that we will have. Thanks for your attention uh, for this highlight. What is uh, the need of, of the industry so far in order to go to scale? And I would like to invite as a, as a first speaker of the panel, Andreas Kuhlmann. He's the CEO of DENA, the German Energy Agency. Andreas is uh, for many, many years very, really uh, involved and um, he um, has become also an expert on hydrogen. I'm very <laughs> happy to, um, to see that, to see you, Andreas. Um, we know that you are closely cooperating <laughs> with the German um, ministry, with the German government, but also with Ministry of Energy, especially. And uh, I would like to give you the floor for an initial statement and then come back to you with some questions. <laughs> Andreas, you have the floor. Well, Jorgo, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to to everybody for organizing this event. Uh, it's an extremely important uh, matter and issue. It's pretty complicated, of course, but I mean we have to go through this, and, and that's why it is important to well to share some some knowledge here on on that kind of conference. Well, we we at Vienna, we work on renewable fuels and gases in Germany, Europe, and abroad since my, I guess about a decade or so. And uh, we, we work at the interface of politics and markets. We're trying to create frameworks for new business opportunities and also to, to work, especially to reach the global greenhouse gas targets. And that's why I actually believe that um, the carbon footprint of whatever we do with hydrogen is indeed the most important issue we have to deal with. Well, we worked on an e-fuel study in 2017 we worked on hydrogen issues in our lead study on integrated energy systems where we could show that without hydrogen there is no integrated energy possible at the end and also we worked on a study on power fuels in the renewable energy world just lately so one of the most important preconditions for the global trade of power fuels are of course reliable standards and certification schemes uh, we see that in all the talks we have with partners from all over the world and they want to know what kind of um, rules and they can de make deals with, with us in Europe and in, in Germany, of course. We are trying to help those who are working on those um, issues on hydrogen certification and various cons consortiums, like for example, Regatrace. We will talk about others maybe later on. And uh, we will also try to publish a report this year on harmonization opportunities for, for green hydrogen standards. But maybe what is probably interesting here in, in, in that context. We operate a DENA biogas register since quite a while, and uh, this register is used for cert certificate, certificate is issuance for green gases. It's mainly biomethane, but we also have some plants with hydrogen in it already. So we do have some experience, at least with, with the practice here, uh, knowing uh, how important things can become. We also have this Global Alliance of Power Fuels with some industry partners, and we cooperate a lot with you, Jorgo, and uh, other teams as well. And all the time, again and again, uh, regulation and uh, standards and certification is, of course, super important. The AGAR, where we are a member of, is also very important baseline for, for our knowledge on the topic. That's the European Renewable Gas Registry. Well, from our perspective, we work on and welcome activists to set reliable harmonized standards for the production of power fuels globally. These standards have to be transparent and comprehensible and should enable, not prevent, power fuel production. That's actually especially true for regulation. Sometimes I think in the European Union, the way we do regulation here, that is a bit too complicated, but that's another issue. The more countries agree to the standards, the quicker different certification schemes can react to it. 
course, and can offer certification services for the market. At DENA, we welcome market competition between potential hydrogen certification schemes. And for this reason, of course, certifies very important uh, contribution here. One potential certification scheme among several available other options, maybe ISCC. Consequently, DENA advises also other organizations like the Australian Smart Energy Council on setting up a zero carbon certification scheme. The red two delegated acts will be of major importance of course, to create the hydrogen market in the next decade. The goal of red two must be on the one hand to set clear sustainability criteria, clear and understandable. On the other hand, the standards shouldn't prevent the global market development. So the delegated acts should be tailored in a way that considers different frameworks of the global energy markets. And we'll welcome, DINA welcomes this delegated act on renewable electricity criteria for RF and GO production within Europe. However, it seems challenging to prove some of the requirements, such as the 50-minute time correlation, especially in regard to international trade. And here I'm sometimes wondering, you know, if you really want to create a market, why do we start that complicated here? Um, but uh, Jorgo, you know much more about this because you are <laughs> dealing with all these um, issues much more. Red 2 is aimed at transport obligations. Well, but we also need something for industry, of course. Could it be the same or not? We have to discuss uh, this. And we are also looking at additional sustainability criteria. For example, we plan to publish a report on the water consumption um, needs and issues. Water consumption is only mentioned implicitly in the Red 2 so far. But uh, we know from partners that it is very important, especially if you talk about hydrogen coming from MENA. So, so a variety of issues, uh, and uh, I'm very help, uh, thankful that I have a couple of experts dealing with all these concrete issues, but I'm happy to, to join this conference here and learn something and exchange some views. Thank you again. M many thanks, Andreas. <clears throat> I think uh, you mentioned um, the point with the 15 minutes uh, burden of proof, to put it like that. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, to uh, put the ball back into your pitch, <clears throat> it comes, it stems a little bit from Germany. It's um, the idea of additionality, uh, which uh, in the very beginning had some uh, justification, of course. If you don't have enough renewables, you first need to go for additional uh, ramp up of uh, um, renewable energy before you can produce hydrogen. That was the the I know. basic idea, I know. Uh, you know, but we understand now that a very bureaucratic approach during the kickstart phase uh, will will not create a market. But you know, let me, and, let me uh, just reply to this, because this additionality discussion came from, from a couple of years ago already. And that was a time when people were not really believing that we do need hydrogen so much. So sometimes I wonder, I mean, if things do change, we also have to change our attitude towards those questions. But, you know, this is uh, Europe. I mean, if it, once we have something into the regulation, we, we rather uh, look for years to find a complicated solution instead of just changing our mindset a bit. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong. But this is exactly where sometimes the Commission says, oh, the Germans are so successful in introducing uh, renewable energy into the system last year, 46 percent huh, in electricity. Well, congratulations. It, it, it's a high cost, of course. Congratulations. On the other hand, <clears throat> the Commission then says, OK, the, the Germans might have the magical uh, formula. Uh, the Germans then say, aha, uh -huh, uh, the Commission uh, believes in additionality. So it's ping pong and sometimes it's a wrong ping pong. And um, the difficulties between um, the ministries does not help. Um, and you know exactly what I'm referring to. But now is the time, now is the time where we really have to accept uh, that, that something changed. And I would just encourage everybody, especially um, colleagues from the Commission, to also see that um, the author, the, the philosopher uh, of uh, this idea of additionality, um, Mr. Barke, Rainer Barke, has, uh, I think, in the last uh, two or three weeks dramatically changed his point of view and um, this this needs to be uh, taken into account um, but very very well uh, done i i have a question to start with um, to galin and i come back to you of course andreas um, that is uh, about this one eu wide certification uh, system um, 
that would be a tracking system um, to be somehow put into Article 19. Is that something that you have in mind, uh, Galin? Because um, we still uh, are puzzled whether there will be national certification schemes or one uniform European that can be, of course, implemented on a national level. Galin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. So basically, just to clarify, um, first of all, uh, Article 19 is about GOs and uh, the current the, the voluntary scheme certification uh, system is under an other other articles and uh, respectively the sustainability criteria. So when when I say EU wide and I think in, in the strategy EU wide certification system, meaning one system, the implementation could be at national level through voluntary schemes, uh, but EU wide means one system. So whatever is certified uh, is actually the, the same sustainability criteria, the same methodology is applied in the same way of certifying it to ensure that the carbon footprint, whatever, wherever it is, 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 is the same. So the, 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 the this decarbonization solution is there for everyone and in the and the certification is put as, as a, at a level playing field from the point of view of methodological approach and the result of that certification. So that's what I meant. So far, as I mentioned at the beginning, the revision of the of the of the of, of red is not uh, a recast what was already done, but it's more to see what should be changed from the point of view of supporting uh, reaching the targets. From that point of view, one one as you mentioned uh, is uh, can we basically upgrade the geo system to integrate what was also presented in in the previous presentation can we um, uh, upgrade the geo system to cover and to integrate all this information we need in a life cycle approach and the problem here i think uh is basically it depends on the member states and on their willingness to do that as far as i know there's some resistance so far and this is a, a bit um, uh, the, the problem is um whether mem the member states will follow uh and will be willing to have a um let's say obligation to issue geos and there are there are many many aspects uh, also the there are some blockages as far as i know at the level of the standard in the group working on the standard and uh, this makes this is the difficult that's why i said that this is the key difficulty i think in putting the eu wide certification system on the one, on the other hand we have an existing system of voluntary schemes i being icc or other schemes uh, there are other schemes some already applied or like the uh, certified hydrogen, this could be an option for a uh, for a, for a, a scheme uh, spe specialized on, on on hydrogen certification and, and uh, subject to recognition by by the commission. So uh, the point is for me personally is not to reinvent the wheel, but to to put it in a more cost effective way. So to use the infrastructure we have and trying to uh, basically use the voluntary schemes and applying the methodologies which are about to be finalized uh, on, on RFNBOs, the cycle carbon fuels and additionality. So that's for me. But on the geo system, I think it would be a good idea to integrate that into the certification. But if there is a, uh, how to say, resistance from member states to apply this in a harmonized way, then it will be difficult. And uh, in that case, we'll, it, depending on what will be the final approach, but it may be that will not be changing Article 19, but rather going to alternative solutions to voluntary schemes. And uh, in case we see that there are difficulties with the co legislators on this, to put it this way, but this is not a bit outside of our, how to say, control. I don't know what many, I replied. Many, yeah, sorry. No, uh, many thanks. <laughs> I think we will come to the integration of the low carbon fuels later on and I'll, I'll ask then Andreas how, how Germany would possibly see it but let's stay with the uh, with the renewable fuels and there was one question with the chat what what is a refunobio huh? what that's a renewable fuel of non-biological origin so that's basically the definition in red 2 Let, let's stay a little bit with the renewably produced um, and I would like to address this question uh, to both to Walter and, and to you Galin what about the derivatives of renewables so ammonia or methanol, so synthetic um, synthetic fuels. What about them? Would they be also integrated? That's one question here in the chat. Um, or uh, would they be just uh, a, a, consequent, a consequence of uh, the certification scheme here? I see. So, so, so basically, if I very quickly, uh, the idea of RFMBO methodology is basically to have a life cycle approach uh, uh, enabling the transfer of sustainability information from one stage until the other, until the final product. And in some cases, it may stop at the, at the level of the hydrogen, the green hydrogen. In other cases, based on hydrogen, 
uh, we can go into synthetic fuels or so. So the point is that through this methodology, which will be presented, basically it will allow full life cycle um, uh, approach to, and integrating all these possible options, I would say. Um, basically, um, yeah. in, in, integrating the carbon footprint at each stage of what was also discussed, uh, uh, able to calculate the emissions at the, at the final in the final product. So like this, basically anyone, uh, depending on the on the choice, can actually um, market the product, put it this way, and uh, present the, the carbon foot, foot, footprint in a life cycle approach. Could, could I invite uh, uh, Bauta at that stage to uh, also answer the question whether, uh, first of all, how to deal with the derivatives and whether you still can join certified. There was a dedicated question here. Okay, so um, a couple of points. Thank you, Jurgo, for this uh, question. First of all, everybody can uh, can join uh, Concern Certified. There is on the website www.certified.eu. There's a link. You can fill in uh, that, uh, that Google form and then you can be taken up into the stakeholder platform or you can uh, request to uh, to participate in one of the many working groups that we have and actually contribute to the development of uh, of the scheme when we're dealing with uh, hydrogen uh, certification um, I, I personally think that um, making one system for renewable and uh, non-renewable yet low carbon hydrogen it's easy it is it's really easy it's, it's the same setup etc there simply needs to be a willingness uh, from either europe or for the member states to issue a geo for such a product currently the red 2 is mentioning that it's optional for member states to give out uh, renew um, non-renewable geos yet when that would be part of the red 2 revision and we would request it to member states I don't think it would cost them anything more in the implementation. So I think the already the full basis is there, provided that the CO2 data field would be added as a mandatory data field onto the geo instrument. It is not mentioned in the red two. It is very clear from the SEND standard that that's being requested by all of the industry. I would think that it's a great opportunity for the red two revision or the red three to add this data field uh, uh, over there. Next to that, I, I think that um, on the one hand, I think you have very good functioning geo systems at uh, at member state level. There has, uh, so I think that's something that, that can be kept, but you can add on on top of that system to make sure that the sustainability of electricity, geographical temporal correlation and so forth and so onwards are being tested and that you can also allow to uh, do uh, mass balancing over the, the supply chain, basically uh, me measuring the greenhouse gas emissions from the point of production up to the point of uh, consumption. And if that means that there need to be taken intermediary steps like conversions, hydrogen into methanol, for instance, methanol into DME, etc., I think we can perfectly set up such, an, uh, such a system. But I do think it's important that the certification that we see on the Red 2 Article 19 GO and Red 2 Article 25, that we're able to combine them to avoid that one molecule would get two instruments that would be leading to incompatible claims. Because I think we need to be very careful of potential double, uh, double counting. Last but not least, when we talk about the 15 minute uh, intervals, I completely agree with Andreas uh, on his statement. Why to make it so difficult? I don't think that the difficulty is on the certification. We can perfectly find out uh, how we will have to do that. There can be uh, auditors coming yearly to check uh, what uh, the electrolyzer has been consuming at what moment in time. Uh, when did the, the renewable plant uh, produce electricity? We simply need to combine uh, the information from two sources. That being said, this 15 minute in sync requirement is putting a very big burden on the conception of the plants itself. So it's not a certification, it's the plant design, it's the concept, etc. And indeed, it is making it uh, rather, uh, rather expensive to, uh, to do so. There's just a certification a, issue. 
it's just a question that just popped up the burden of complex costly the certification should be put on fossil energy why is it applied to renewables uh, it's quite interesting and i, I think um, this whole concept of additionality as it was invented some years ago needs really a uh, refurbishment uh, I, I would put it like that but Walter, um once i have you here where can the people buy then these certificates how how does it you you mentioned how it works um but how would that uh, then be in practical terms be possible uh, let's start with europe and let's then tackle the question of switzerland ukraine and then I would come back to Andreas because Germany has a, has a global uh, view. Um, can, can you describe that a little bit? So currently when we look at renewable electricity geos, which is a, a much more mature market than renewable hydrogen geos, which is still in its infancy, we see it's an over-the-counter uh, market. What does it mean? It means that all the actors who have geos into their portfolio, they, they are talking via phone bilateral agreements to people who like to buy buyers are contacting uh, potential sellers etc there is no platform there is no exchange the moment people make a deal they sign a contract they look into their the registry where their certificate is being based and they tell to the operator of the database or the registry please move my certificates from my account to another account so it's an over-the-counter market. There is not an exchange yet. What we are doing today, in case you would like to have an AGO, you can send an email to certify at initio.com. I advise people to ask an amount of, uh, of hydrogen in megawatt hours, explaining as well uh, what could be the end customer. For instance, it's a uh, glass manufacturing plant in Germany, provide some information, and we will be forwarding it towards um, uh, everybody having geos into their account. That's how we try to actually kickstart the market, which is a, which is not ideal, but it's already better than to what a renewable electricity geos has as an uh, as an option. Um, we're going to revitalize also the Certify EU website. We're going to ask whether all of the people having geos whether we can list their contact details and uh, and not not all of the companies are to, too eager to uh, to do so. So the certify at initial.com uh, address, I think it's a fairly good uh, intermediary uh, intermediary step. When we talk to outside of uh, EU, so first of all, the RETU introduced um, that the geo instrument is being recognized between EU and uh, the EEA. So Norway is definitely in. Um, Switzerland, there, there's still big questions. What needs to be done to the energy community? What would will happen to, uh, to Switzerland? Will they be able to sign a bilateral agreement with the European Commission for cross-border recognition? Very strange situation for Switzerland because under the red one, automatically they were part of this uh, mutual recognition club. And Switzerland has been one of the leading nations within the IEB uh, when, when it deals with renewable electricity. All of a sudden in the red two, they appear to be out. So I, I really hope that that situation will be solved. Then we go to the situation of Ukraine, or let, let's call it uh, Mar Morocco. I think, first of all, uh, quite a lot of capacity building needs to uh, to be done there. Uh, laws needs to be put in practice, like uh, consumer disclosure laws, uh, etc. Um, they need to implement a system. And then, then again, they would need a bilateral agreement to get together with, uh, with uh, the European Commission, which is a, apparently a very heavy process to uh, to, uh, to 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 put in uh, to put into uh, into place so i definitely hope that they can make the right uh, changes into the law implement robust uh, systems uh, they're definitely willing to uh, to implement the european systems but then thereafter it's up to the european commission to sign a bilateral agreement with them otherwise their geos will not be recognized within uh, within the eu by the way, uh, Walter, is, then an, is there an anticipated cost for GOs? Do you have an, a range, any range or any idea? Yes. Um, when we see, uh, by the way, all of the cost of renewable electricity GOs, I repeat, renewable electricity GOs, uh, you can find them on the website of the IEP, depending on the nation, etc. Typically, there are issuance fees uh, when it comes to 
the issuance of a renewable electricity geo, the transfer of a renewable electricity geo from one account to another one, uh, and, the, and the cancellation for the use of that geo. And when you add all of them to, together, you are around five cents uh, per uh, five cents per, per megawatt hour. So also for certify, we said even though that the market is much smaller, and thanks to the funding of the FCA GU, we are maintaining the, the the same price. In case the volumes go up and the volumes are tiny at this moment in time, of course we hope that uh, we will be able to uh, to charge less. It's Thank not you. a very making machine <laughs> uh, at all, but it's important that we have an, a low admin burden to kickstart and support this market. Many thanks. Question to Andreas. Um, in, in Germany, there is no competent authority or issuing body for these hydrogen GOs. At least it has not been appointed yet. Do you think there will be a system by the end of 2021? Yeah, well, good point. <laughs> it's again one of these issues uh, we are talking. <laughs> well, you know Germany as good as I know. Um, I mean, if there if there is a limit, they will certainly try to to, to mention one uh, so far. But but at the moment you're right, and I don't I, I can't tell you more about this. It's still in, in discussion, but they certainly know that they have some work to do here. And when it comes to the international um, mm. global field. Germany is uh, the only country that has attributed already um, in their hydrogen strategy, nine, nine billion in, in all in all, um, out of which two billion go for imports. Mm -hmm. Is there any idea how to um, yeah, implement this GO st um, strategy also for these countries? Uh, we, we saw Wouter mentioned already uh, two, two of the main, main countries, most important countries like Ukraine and Morocco. But are there any ideas uh, flying around in Berlin about that? Well, talks and negotiations, as I said, we are in talks with um, people in, in Australia and some people in Canada having uh, showing interest to talk about these um, certification issues. But I think, first of all, I mean, we have to, to be clear about um, the, the rules, regulations, the requirements we do have in the European Union in, in general. And uh, as, as far as we do have this, then uh, all those who want to really invest and plan in other countries all over the world have some kind of you know plan. That's really very much at the beginning, but um, this is a very open question, and that is uh, getting a high risk that we do not have um, these uh, questions answered yet, uh, because it, it, well, it will take time. Nobody will uh, set up something if it, he doesn't know uh, whether he meets the criteria and so. So we're getting there at the moment, and those criteria we already know can be checked and can be discussed with partners. Um, but um, yeah, that's all I can tell you at the moment. Thank you. I have a question to uh, Galin. Um, when calculating the carbon footprint at the different stages of the value chain, to whom will the CO2 be allocated when considering um, CCU to the CO2 emitter or to the COU? CO2 user, what's the position of the European Commission so far? It's a good question. <laughs> I'm interested in that answer as well. It's not easy, but it's not I easy. To... To... Um, the methodology is there, the draft methodology is there, but so far it's under reflection. So it's difficult to take a stance now, I think, in this, mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, setting. Yeah. Um, okay, if, I, if I may and get back to yeah. that, this is very important for yeah. all the scenarios we do. I mean, we're currently working on a huge project with 80 companies and uh, of course the question where would you put the carbon dioxide figure to is very very important if you make scenarios for your own country and um, yeah but for the for the moment you have to both show both possibilities so uh, i completely agree with andreas eh? we have we see a, a lot of power to methanol uh, projects uh, etc for them methanol of course it contains carbon uh, carbon dioxide uh, or the, the, the C is part of the, the methanol uh, formula. It's really important that they can get clarity as soon as possible on what could be the, um, the required CO2 source that they uh, have to do. Because when you deal with such a question, it's really uh, answering to what kind of e-fuels will be recognized to be uh, read to Article 25 compliant or not. And this is actually crucial 
for a lot of investment decisions at this uh, at this uh, at this moment. So clarity. Well, you thanks, the 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 problem problem is clear. You wanted to add something? Did we interrupt you? No, no. The the problematic is clear. So um... okay, very good. <laughs> Very good. No, it's it's a difficult one, um, and we need to deal with it. Um, uh, I would use the last five minutes because in in five minutes I unfortunately will pass over to to Bart again. Um, I would use this time uh, to discuss a little bit the digital aspect because we have a lot of questions in in the Q and A uh, that are dealing um, with digital technologies uh, to make this market transparent. I mean, we have heard from about her that it's a, an over-the-counter business uh, and uh, it seemed how you described it uh, about a quite antique to put it like that uh, and my, my question is um, would a classical certification system even be capable of ensuring end-to-end -end transparency and traceability as we as we put it here would there be any technologies that we could use so distributed ledger technologies like blockchain are always discussed as a, as a possible way out. Uh, I, I would like to address this question to all three of you, uh, but possibly starting with Walter, who uh, I, I know he's a little bit hesitant, but uh, um, please give us your view. Um, first of all, I'm a big fan of everything that's digitalization. So I, uh, I've been studying uh, business informatics just before the the, the e bubble bursted, and then I wasn't able to do anything with my uh, with my master degree anymore. And out of misery, I started uh, studying finance afterwards. So, but I, I remain a fan of digitalization. Um, um, no, I, I I think that. Um, Blockchain I, might optimize the certification process and might potentially lead to lesser administra uh, administration uh, issues um, or administrative costs. That being said, you need to have an incredible robust system that puts in place before you implement blockchain. Because blockchain doesn't deal well with changes. And let us be right now into a period of very intense regulatory changes that will have an impact on a certification system. Next to that, I do think that blockchain um, uh, implementing it, there's a real question of, uh, of oversight. Uh, so that's something that we, uh, that we all need to, uh, need to have a look at. And is an algorithm, is, is that enough as per the European or the national law to provide oversight? Open question. Last but not least, I, I would like to stress that many people mentioned that blockchain is important to uh, prevent fraud. But it, it is only partially, but I think the main part that needs to that needs to be kept into place is that you have to send auditors to uh, to big chemical plants because you can put a blockchain uh, sensor anywhere onto a machine. You just need to make sure that next to that electrical line there's not another line of electricity being fed to the same electrolyzer and then producing more hydrogen so all this uh, human intervention and control will always remain uh, important that being said blockchain i don't necessarily think it helps on uh, the, the making of an exchange either already in renewable electricity geos again this is a very mature market we see that certain traders are changing from um, to the model of what they call name passing trader. And there are certain uh, companies already in, in Europe where you can have a bulletin board, just like into a stock exchange, where you can see who is able to buy and who is able to, uh, to sell. And this is, I think, one of the things we will be working on Certify Working Group 3 on how can we kickstart this market? How can we enable it? Because I do agree that uh, phoning one another uh, seems to be a rather old fashioned in, in today's world. A, a little bit. Uh, I would like to integrate uh, Galin because uh, um, I know that uh, another commissioner, so Commissioner Breton, who is also uh, responsible for the digital um, agenda of the EU, is extremely interested in exactly that question, as he is also a sponsor of the uh, European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. So he has been he has been asked this question several times already in Parliament, but also uh, in other occasions. And he, he he is on it. But how on is the EU Commission in, in general when it comes to the digitalization of this aspect? 
Um, just I, I'll start by saying that for me, the certification system should be done through auditing, through applying methodology, and the human factor is important. And uh, the digital side, I would say, is more as a supporting tool for the traceability and for the traceability and transfer of that information, which is certified and audited from one stage to the other one, in, and also supporting the, the auditing and the certification process by aggregating and not allowing double counting or uh, all these aspects. So fr from that point of view, and that was the... The, the 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 legal obligation and the the idea of having the union database uh and, and for, for transport so if uh, if our proposal would be yeah further um extended then the, the union database once fun functional uh, logically could cover any end use sector uh for, for the same for the same energy type so uh, the point blockchain actually is one of the solutions we have been in we are currently with our it team uh uh, considering the problem uh, specifically for the union database um, uh, is that um, it, uh, probably it, it uh, blockchain could be a solution for um, for one value chain, but when you combine casios and liquid transport fuels, you have it's a, it's a very complex ecosystem. So how to use to actually use blockchain? This this is a, 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 a issue we need to, to, to tackle. But so far uh, it's not. Let's say we're not um, how to say. There is no one view on, on, on it, but in any case, uh, there should be, a, a, let's say, a digital system um, tracing the consignments with their sustainability characteristics from one stage to the other, uh, whether it will be through, through blockchain or through, um, through a, a different solution. The, the difficulty is basically when you need to combine when this, uh, this consignment is changing from, from one, uh, let's say, uh, fuel into another and that sustainability characteristics they, they they should be transferred but also aggregated in a whole mass balance system and this is quite complicated i would say so uh, this is those are the issues we are thinking about in the different uh, in the different uh, value chains yeah it's complicated I'll, uh, I'll pass it also on to you andreas and possibly you might also tackle the question of h2 global <laughs> because uh, this might make it even more complicated but with that, uh, I would also pass on the moderation and uh, the yeah. rest to Barry. Uh, well, Many thanks. Asia Global is another topic. Uh, that <laughs> working on this foundation thing, uh, maybe the, maybe the next panel. Just want to, to tell you that we are working on a project um, which is called Blockchain Machine Identity Ledger. It's a complicated word, but uh, we're trying to build a piece of highway here. It's a register for, for all kinds of electricity uh, um, instruments to put together this is not not that easy but it could be at the end of course address one part of what we need for the hydrogen issue to make the other things easier so i hope we do not wait um, um with the hydrogen market uh, until we have the, the, the blockchain uh, ready here for, for this project thanks thanks for this one i'll give over to you Thank you very much, uh, Jorgo. Uh, thanks for the moderation. You did really an amazing job. And I, I know that you have to run, so uh, no worries. Uh, please please go and thanks again for, for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I think you already quite covered quite a lot of um, the questions, but there was uh, one question. Um, um, I think it's mainly to the commission, but um, the question was maybe for you, Gavin, is that with the revision of the red two, it is not fully clear whether the entire green or renewable hydrogen is linked to the renewable RFNBOs, or is it still possible to produce green hydrogen through renewable energy under other frameworks, as for example using geos? Could you please clarify these classification possibilities and how the two are interlinked? I'll try, I'll try to clarify. So basically, um, uh, for for saying that. Uh, um, um, uh, hydrogen is renewable and the respective synthetic fuels are passing the threshold. Uh, you need to apply the, 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 the methodology w that, that we are de developing. Uh, and this, whether this will be, uh, let's say, certified through a GO or through different uh, certification system, I mean, in the end, uh, what matters is the result. So if, if, if a certification system is taking the information from a GO or a member state develops a national GO plus system to cover all these aspects, I think all this, uh, let's say the, the devil is in the detail, but it should be possible, I would say. Yeah. I don't know if it's clear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's clear. Uh, I saw there also was a, a question, if you make hydrogen from bio, 
uh, maybe to water and, and how, how do you attribute then the different uh, CO2 or how would would be uh, say, judged on? Uh, the current way that this geo system is going to be set up as per the red two and as per the the, the sand standard, it would mean that the hydrogen would be of uh, uh, would have as a source biomass. So you can uh, you can have a manure based uh, hydrogen, you can have a sludge based uh, sludge water based uh, hydrogen, uh, and so forth and so onwards. And the red two provides uh, a list of carbon intensity of all of those feedstocks. Of course, we need to take into account uh, the the conversion losses of the uh, of the electro of, of turning that biomass into electricity and electricity into uh, into uh, into hydrogen. So the more uh, convergence you will be doing, the higher carbon intensity per megawatt hour of uh, energy vector that you would have. Yeah. <clears throat> Somebody else would like to comment also on that. Okay, uh, maybe a, a question uh, to 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 everybody uh, about the international collaboration. I mean, as I said, I, uh, we know that uh, Germany is already working quite a lot internationally together. Uh, but uh, how important is to have to have an international uh, collaboration uh, on the methodology for CO2 calculation or CO2 footprint for each uh, hydro production uh, pathway? How important is it? And for example. How about uh, these uh, countries? Because I got some questions, or, for example, like Australia or Chile or several questions to join the, um, let's say, to certify project. Maybe both you can answer first and then maybe the others. Um, especially also I would like to hear from the commission. How do they see the international collaboration on that? And then maybe Germany can share a bit your experience already so far. Okay, well, for me, um... Australia, Chile, U USA, they're, they're reaching out to us and I think they realize that Certify is likely to, to be the most mature um, program that, that, that's out there. So I, I would say um, we, we are available um, to put our knowledge available to, to other nations, um, whether it's our system or any other, it doesn't really matter that much, I would say, but I think it's of crucial importance that the world would uh, would convert on uh, on terminology, on uh, on data fields, data units, measurement techniques, uh, the, the governance of uh, the, the, the quality assurance of, of, of that process, because otherwise uh, we will not have hydrogen as a new energy vector. That being said, I think Europe has, an, uh, has a very uh, straight, uh, we have the, the lead on this, we have it as part of our directives. We have part of a, we have our shaping a, a sand standard. We have the hydrogen council, which is calling uh, upon the European Commission or, or upon Europe to to work on on hydrogen certification and to uh, and and to bring that towards uh, towards the, the the global community. And I think there we have a fantastic chance to to show our leadership on a, on on the topic, uh, and to also make sure that um, this this new energy vector is not going to be like the barrel uh, denominated in uh, in dollars, but rather in uh, in euros. In that regard, I already have one big recommendation. I think uh, we see that uh, during the the writing of our SEN standard, we're making references to quite a lot of the. European directives, I think it is a mistake because it will hamper the uptake uh, of the SEN standard at, uh, at ISO level. I think it's rather more important to, to write the text of our directives into the standard. That way there's no reference made to a European directive and it will be way more easy to, uh, to take it up at an uh, at ISO level to go for global standardization uh, ASAP. Mm -hmm. We have a leadership role, let's take it. And let's bring that as quick as we can. <clears throat> Sounds reasonable to me, if I may reply. Um, also, I, I would even say that Europe has a high responsibility because we, I mean, we, we have so high standards. Huh? And sometimes, I'm, I, well, as I said, I wonder whether these standards are maybe a bit too high once in a while because uh, this this discussion on colors. By the way, huh? For me, this um, climate footprint is super important we see in all scenarios huge amounts huge amounts of uh, hydrogen power fuels we do need 
And if you're not open for a global markets, if you're not open for different colors of hydrogen, united colors of hydrogen, like blue, for example, and so on, uh, then it will be very difficult. That's my opinion. And uh, we can only be uh, open-minded here if you know about the footprint uh, and, uh, as exactly as possible, because that's the currency we, 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 are, we need for our discussions and for reaching our targets. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Gavlin. Uh, just um, to, com to complement yes. on that, um, I can only agree that actually um, that's what, what I mentioned at the very beginning, that the, the point of having certification system EU-wide uh, is to have the same level of, of methodological approach in, 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 the different, in the different countries. So it's the same globally, just expanding the same, the same concept. So um, uh, the, the, um, it's, it's very important, uh, obviously, to have these discussions uh, also bilaterally, but something probably to, to reflect on is basically uh, once, once we would, I hope, uh, have a, a, a fully fledged certification system uh, for hydrogen. Uh, basically, like with the with the biofuels, for example, this could actually, uh, let's say, circumvent this, the, the need for these bilateral uh, agreements. Since having, uh, let's say, a global, uh, let's say, scheme like ISCC or 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 or, or other schemes uh, uh, focusing on, on on hydrogen, let's say, as well. So this certification basically would avoid probably the need to have bilateral since the, the global standard will be applied by that scheme. So it's like, like with the biofuel or the feedstocks, basically uh, a consignment certified by that scheme, which recognize, recognized by the commission, would basically ensure that global aspect uh, and the, without the, the need for the long discussions on a bilateral basis with the different countries, as it, as it is in the biofuels market um, for, for any feedstock coming outside of the, of the EU or, or fuels coming outside of the EU. Uh, this could be a, uh, a way out, I would yeah. say. I know, uh, Galin, that also um, the DGNR is also co-leading the IPHE task force on, on this CO2 uh, footprint. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that and, and, and what is basically at the end uh, the kind of aim? I, I'm not directly participating there, but I think it's, it's also about um, uh, the, the harmonization, the harmonization of standards to basically to, 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 to see what what are the plans and what what basically it's an exchange of experience and uh, in the in the methodological approach. And uh, as far as I know, there are concrete discussions on methodologies there. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe Walter, you could say something about that. I think IPHG is, uh, is is doing is doing very good work. Eh? So they 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 are really discussing a, a whole set of uh, of methodologies. But in the end, what they will produce is unfortunately enough, I would say, only recommendations because they uh, they don't have a mandate to produce something that uh, that has to be adopted. But that I think I, and I hope that it can be a basis for, uh, for instance, a, a worldwide uh, ISO standard. We, but of course, yeah, it's an, uh, it's a government to government body. Sometimes also their political deals will, would have to be uh, made. And we see that so certain players are pushing quite a lot of, um, to protect their national feedstock. Um, also when that's coal. So I, um, so also I think that uh, that's going to be uh, fun inside those, uh, into inside those uh, to, to, to committees to, to find a consensus that is pro protecting the individual geopolitical interest and, and still make something that tr trustworthy uh, towards end consumers globally. Yeah, well, thank so, you. So oh, far, yes. I think that uh, it's it's more a kind of a forum to exchange ideas to see that what are the alignments in, in the approaches rather than something being, let's say, in for, on the enforcement side, I would say. Yeah. And it, it's probably a, a good tool to, to align on a certain methodologies. Thank you. Well, we have uh, 30 seconds left, so I would like to use the opportunity to thank uh, Wouter uh, for your expertise. Also, Andreas Kuhlman, thank you so much for uh, your insights on, on the German market and also to clearly say what, what you're expecting also from the EU. And uh, Galen, Thank you very much to clarify a bit uh, the current situation of discussions in the EU. I understood that not everything is yet 100% clear. You cannot inform us yet at this point in time how the discussion is going. But anyway, I really a big thank to all of, of three of you uh, for being here. And I would conclude just with, with saying that what I understood is hydrogen will be a global uh, commodity. And I think it's crucial that we need a certification, uh, global certification in order to unlock global trade 
and it's crystal clear for me that Europe should keep playing a leading role in the certification. We have been experienced now for seven years. Let's use our experience and let's make sure that we get this thing done. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this thank webinar. You. Also to the audience, thank you very much thank for listening. You. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye to everybody. And we will put everything anyway on our website later on. Thank you.